This is Talking Mule Deer with your hosts, Steve Belinda and Jody Stemmler. Talking Mule Deer takes you on a journey to learn more about the Mule Deer Foundation, Mule Deer and black tailed Deer Biology and Management, tips and tactics for hunting, conservation issues, and even features some of our corporate and celebrity partners. Now, let's start talking Mule Deer. Hello, it's Jody Stemmler. We're here in Denver, Colorado, and uh, we're talking mule deer today with the director of Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Bob Broshide. Bob, how are you doing? I'm great, Jody. Good. How are you? And obviously, Steve's here with us. Yeah, as well. don't forget about me, I Jody. would not forget about <laughs> you, Nobody Steve. forget about Nobody Steve. Nobody forgets about Steve. Well, Bob's an old friend, so I'll, I'll give him the, the benefit of the doubt for not, you know, thinking about me on the intro. But Bob, it's great to see you here. Got great weather in Denver. And uh, so, Colorado. Big bucks, lots of mule deer, lots of issues going on. How does one get to a position that you're in as the state director of Colorado Parks and Wildlife? And really, what's your interest in mule deer? What brought you to the point you're at today? Wow. Well, mule deer, in my mind, represents the West. And it, it's it's an iconic figure of the West. It's only in the West. Um, you know, as far as you know, I was getting here, um, you know, I spent about, I don't know, about 23 years in Arizona uh, with the Game and Fish Department there. And it was just about five years ago, almost to the day wow. that I got this job to come up and uh, uh, Happy run. anniversary. Hey, yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> five years. It's, uh, I've already beaten the record. You've lost um, your tan. Yeah, I have. I have. That, that first winter was a little rough, believe me. <laughs> Um, but, uh, no, to, to take a chance to jump at a, a state like Colorado with the resources that we have here, unbelievable. Uh, it was one of those you couldn't pass up. And, um, so I've been here for five years and the, yeah, time has flown by, but, uh, you know, being from Arizona and Colorado, and, and as you both well know, mule deer declines in the West, uh, has been a top priority. Uh, it's what's happening. What is going on with mule deer? Um, you know, our working groups that we have as states and, and NGOs all come together, uh, NGOs pouring money onto the ground, we're conducting research. Uh, all of those things are starting to, uh, I guess, lead up to, you know, what's going on and, and how can we reverse that trend? Um, well, in Colorado, um, worked through a, a mule deer initiative a few years ago, uh, focusing on the West Slope, uh, right? Am we I, did. Yeah, yeah and it, it culminated into a mule deer strategy, right. which is an all, everything that could possibly be contributing to the decline is something we wanted to attack from, from predators to habitat to disease, uh, and then using research to basically shore that up and make management level decisions down the I, road. I imagine that's not an easy thing, particularly when you roll predators into the mix. No. Um, how do hunters fit into this? I mean, we're in the middle of deer seasons right now, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of folks say, well, if we want to bring back deer, let's quit hunting them. How does an agency like yours that has to manage not just for the species itself, but also for the users mm -hmm. balance that need? Well, it's hunters are the conservationists and the conservationists is ter it leads into money for us to be able to do these things. So, so you're talking about license sales license and also sales. the excise tax of the, exactly. the, the other stuff. I imagine that there's a lot of money brought into your communities, particularly places like Rifle, Craig, Meeker, oh, yeah. Grand Junction. Just shy of a billion dollars is what hunting wow. brings into Colorado. Wow. And so how are hunting seasons going this year? I mean, um, so far I, I've seen pictures, uh, people <laughs> have, uh, I, I'm what? going, you don't have time to go out. <laughs> I am going this Thursday. Yay. Uh, I am going out myself, but, uh, uh, you know, between it's been a weird year. Uh, we had a significant drought this year. Yes. Um, the elk hunting has been really slow. It's been like that for the last couple of years. Mule yep. deer. I'm seeing some nice pictures of, of mule deer that are coming in. Um, so, yeah, we're, we'll wait and see. Once the surveys and everything comes back, I think we'll have a better handle on it. Well, in the snow, I know we've had, I had several friends who've gone out and no snow in the high country yeah. doesn't push the animals down. They're youth yeah. tags, friends, um, kids who are going out for the first time, and so they didn't see it. But we got 6 to 12 in the, they were calling yeah. for, right? So maybe your timing's good. <laughs> maybe it is. I'm, I'm sure hoping to. But. So, so how many folks hunt mule deer or, or want to hunt mule deer in Colorado every year? Wow, the demand here is incredible. Um, and for, for one, it's, it's to understand how we do our licensing. Um, Colorado is, is probably one of the more liberal, non-resident hunting states I have seen. I, and I talk to most of the Western states. 
we really bend over backwards for the non-residents. So non-residents non contribute about $90 million between elk and deer hmm. to Colorado. Um, the residents, and that's mainly because the license right. cost is higher for non-residents. And uh, residents, um, uh, the demand continues to, to a point where they're all limited licenses. I mean, right. it's all draw. And, but the opportunity is still there between federal lands, state lands, private lands now. We've got a really robust private land hunting program. And it's a way to get folks out, get them out so they can harvest the deer. Um, we do have returned and over-the-counter or leftover license opportunities. So all of that culmination, Colorado's demand is is growing well and it grew a lot this year too right because there was a change in your licensing structure so you saw a huge it did. jump because it used to be that you had to pay the full price of the tag and then if you didn't draw you would get your money back but right, right. is that correct and then go ahead yo with less application fees a couple dollars here and there, yeah and so. so and right exactly so but then this year you didn't have to pay the full price of the tag so right. anybody who wanted to try to get in or get a preference point or do something they were able to that's right put in so you so i don't know the numbers but i'm quite sure it was half again as many people who applied for tags here um it was this year and you're you hit it right in the head jody is is the commission decided to enact what many other states have done is you only pay after you've been drawn um, we're trying to figure a way through if you just want a preference point how we can keep you kind of out of the draw and for those who actually want to hunt so anyway um, we saw about twenty nine thousand brand new applicants wow. this year because of that for all species all or just, species wow, yeah, yeah. And, and primarily the sheep goat and moose you know, are the most highly sought after, right. require the most preference points. Uh, that's, we did see people put in for that, but, uh, and, and we had a lot of concern from the public. Uh, they were really it freaking made out. their draw, it's a lot higher, right? Well, uh, if you're a first time applicant though, you don't get in uh, into right. that consideration for in, four years. Into the deer, I mean, sorry, the goat, sheep goat, sheep and, and moose. moose. Right, yeah. Right. Yep. So we're trying to figure a way right now, actually working with the commission and sportsmen to kind of figure, okay, there, there are people that have 18, 19 preference points for these species. How do we, you know, the more sought after, do we raise a preference point fee? Do we raise the application fee? So we're kind of going through all yeah. that, but the take home message is that 29,000 new It shows there's demand. It shows there's a lot of demand. We're there seeing that is. in other states too. I know Montana and Wyoming have gone up significantly in the last few years. What do you yeah. think's driving that? Is this a social media craze? The, the, the age of more disposable income for folks, the fact that, you know, a lot of us are just getting older and want to not wait till it's too late to take these hunts that we've all dreamed about. I mean, you know, I, that's a great question, Steve. I, and I wish we had the way to dissect out what's going on. But I think you hit on it. I think with the economy doing well, people have more disposable income. Um, we're also re re stratifying and restructuring hunts to take advantage of weekend opportunities versus weekdays. Um, we're seeing new folks coming in. Uh, we are seeing new hunters coming into to hunting. Um, and so we're, it's kind of a culmination of all of these things. Uh, I think what separates Colorado from many states uh, that are mostly, mainly uh, public land states is the fact that we've got private landowners that are opening their lands up. I mean, they do have, we do have landowner tags. We do a lot of work with them. But, you know, taking advantage of that, of those programs, I think builds tolerance for those animals, whether they're elk or deer, whatever, on their land. If they know that one, there's an income coming in, and it's and it's the, always the the elephant in the room when you talk about North American model of wildlife management and public trust and things. But so I I think with Colorado, you know, our 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 efforts have really been is to get private landowner buy-in as part of the wildlife management uh, scheme. It, they are. About half of the state is private lands. And if, and if we can build that tolerance for landowners to have larger or substantial herds on their property, with the trade-off being that they can sell private landowner licenses, I don't think, and, and I don't think anybody in my agency thinks, that we would have near the populations that we do with the largest elk population in in the lower 48, 
that I don't think um, a lot of those battles that we would have between private landowners of, of calling and, and fencing and keeping them out, um, I, it's a trade-off that we've made, but I think it's a trade-off that has paid off because of that. And, and I think that opportunity then for hunters to, to put in for the draw, not get drawn, maybe there's a leftover license or, or a returned or refunded license, and then you can still go hunt on private land. It's, there's a lot of opportunities there that you can hunt every, every, almost every species in this state every year. And, and coming from Arizona, you, you can't do that in Arizona. Correct? No, yeah. it's, it's a full draw, and it's you put in, and if you don't get drawn – We'll see you next year. Right. So have you seen or has there been any feedback to the department that the quality of the opportunity is going down or the woods are just getting too crowded? Oh, yeah. We do hear that a lot, Steve. It's, you know, the crowding issue, um, as you know, you're a hunter, you know, they're, they're, they're not spread out all over the landscape. Snow may fall, like Jody mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, and They're right where I go every time that's with right. the bow. Well, so. <laughs> and there's different uses, that's too. Right. So some people want that oh, yeah. quiet backcountry, and others need or yeah. want to use their OHVs. Which and... is a great point. And, and then there's various seasons. I mean, you're going from archery to muzzleloader to rifle, and, and those animals are getting, you know, they're getting chased around, but... With Colorado, the outdoor rec, you know, the, the trails and the hikers, bikers, um, snowmobilers, all, you know, those are all out on the landscape, too, that it, it, we do hear about quality. Uh, how do we enhance the quality, make it, um, uh, make it much more pleasurable where you're, you may be alone? But the, the hard thing to nail in, in the things that we always get feedback on is, well, what is quality to you? It, we're, we all have our own vision of what quality is, and you try to accommodate, but how do you s not stretch the season out to be five months long? Um, right. and then right. you well, you still have to manage uh, you know, a healthy population yes. that's not getting chased around constantly um, because right. you're, you commented about the mountain bikers and the off-highway vehicles and snow machines and mm -hmm. hikers and r rafters and the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan mm -hmm. that Colorado is required to do every five years is, is, is about to come out. Um, and that's an issue, right, to try to figure out because not only are these animals being moved around during hunting season, you've got people walking trails. Um, then during, you know, important wintering range areas, um, you know, so how do you balance all the different needs? Because lots of people come to Colorado to do climbing, biking, hiking, camping, all of the other stuff, as well as many people coming for hunting. You know, it's, that's, again, that's the, the million dollar question. Um, like you mentioned, our SCORP is, is going hey, what's to, what's oh, SCORP there, Bob? It's a, st a statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. Okay, it, so it's all inclusive for all the different types of recreation. Well, it had never, it, it hadn't been. Um, this was, uh, for most, of, most of the state park agencies use this. It, this is, SCORP is to LWCF is what the to state wildlife Land and Water Action Conservation plan. Fund, which yep. is a federal funding source, and states can get um, funding for recreation and parks and things like that right. through that. Um, and they're required to have a statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan, also known as SCORP. Right. And, and, and what we've done, I've, I've seen when I first got here five years ago, um, I, we signed off on it, and it was, a, it was a pretty good plan. Were you still just the Division of Wildlife when you started, or you, had they made the merge already? They had made the merge They've, in 11. So yeah, I had okay. come on um, late 14. So okay. um, we were already in the throes of a, of a new plan to, to look at all outdoor recreation. And really... You know, it, it had been sort of treated like, well, you know, this is what LWCF, we, we talk about everything in Colorado, Land and Water Conservation Fund, fund funds primarily trails through the park side of our agency on public lands, parks, and on. And so this year, and this renewal, I wanted this to be much more comprehensive. And you may have seen the numbers but we're we're talking about sixty some billion dollars is what outdoor recreation brings to Colorado. Wow, and and that is about ten percent of of the domestic product figure. I mean, this is outdoor rec is huge. Now it's a it's a growing demand. There's growing conflicts out there, and so what we really tried to capture was hunting, fishing, kayaking, whitewater rafting, and biking, and all of those things are wrapped in. It's not an either or. 
Well, and it's also a recognition of um, all recreation has impact. There's an awful right. lot of people who think that, well, I'm camping, that doesn't have an impact, or I'm hiking, that doesn't have impact, but it does. Yeah. And it impacts our wildlife quite a bit. I mean, those trails that you're putting in might go through, again, winter range or, um, or mm -hmm. move the distribution of wildlife in different ways. So yeah. being able to look at it as a big picture is, is pretty innovative it for a really state to is. do that. Oh, I agree. And that's really what the, the, the behind this plan is really is to lay that out there. Whereas one is to, is to create and, and, and the industry to support an ethic that you're right, everything we're doing out there has an impact somewhere. You may not think so, but you know that was the other driving force behind this is um, where we develop a group, it's called the Colorado Outdoor Partnership, as a way to bring those groups in, the mountain bikers, the land trusts, and, and hunting and fishing organizations, et cetera, and, and crafted these seven principles that of one is everything has an impact. All recreation has an impact and Hunters and anglers have been funding, funding conservation and wildlife management and habitat protection for decades. And how can we now create this? That How can a, a mountain biker, for example, care as much about wildlife as the hunters do? And then vice versa. Hunting and angling needs to recognize that mountain biking is an economic driver. Of Which of those big. scenarios you just laid, those are going to be tougher. Uh, the hunters <laughs> accepting the bikers. Um, yeah. Because, you know, and, and I see it from their side, Steve, is, is they, you know, we've had, as hunters, we've had public lands. And all we keep, we keep seeing is, is increasing urbanization, increasing development, increasing recreational use. And what happens is the hunter and angler starts to lose. They're losing that favorite spot or that herd gets fragmented by a highway. And, and it's, it's just eroding death by a thousand cuts kind of an approach. But... The way to get ahead of it, Jody, you mentioned it earlier, is we need to we need to develop what our plan is for the state. Where is it we're going to maintain habitats? Where is it we're going to maintain recreation? And then how can we kind of bridge bridge them in between? Well, it gives you some guidance on where you're going to spend your money and resources, right. what your priorities are. And I imagine not everyone's going to be happy. Right. But as a state director, you have to do that. You can't be everything to every person. Right. Um, well, and the SCORP isn't prescriptive on specific no. projects. Right. It is a big picture. These are the things that have to right. be considered. Um, so so it's a it's a pretty, uh, again, it's very innovative that Colorado has done something mm -hmm. that is that broad um, and, and mixes the conservation with the recreation. It, that, that's unusual for, for states to do that in right. their SCORP. Um, that was out for public comment in October, so it's probably going to be released um, by the beginning of the new year, probably. Yeah, um, that's so. what we're on track for. Yep. Yeah. So, Bob, besides dealing with the recreation side of the business, I know that half of your state is public lands, either Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management, and also... Uh, and others. Okay, well, Fish and Wildlife Service. And Park and Service. Park Service yeah. and mm -hmm. Department yeah. of Defense and others. Yeah. Um, you probably have to have good relationships with them, and you have to, to have some sort of relationship with your elected officials in the legislature. I mean, give us a little bit of what goes into the day of the life of a state director. Because we all think it's a you're out there making sure, you know, hunters are happy. But it, there's so much more to it. There is. Um, yeah. This business, it comes down to relationships. You can throw non-governmental organizations into that. You know, we're all... We're all part of the tip of the spear. We are not the tip. Um, we don't own a lot of land. And we, we do have the authority for wildlife over, over all of those lands minus the Park Service. It requires relationships. They manage the habitat. We manage the wildlife. And there's a lot of uh, um, issues going on out there from drought and fires to you name it. And our, our, my goal has been is to build those relationships that we're not always going to agree. Um, the federal government gets mandates that come down. Um, we have needs and desires of our customers, and we try to meet in the middle and, and work cooperatively. But it's essential, it's, and it's daily uh, to try to maintain relationships. We're all people. We all have our own biases, and we, you know, it, it's just the way it works. And you're constantly trying to mend, remend, repair 
Uh, and, and then also, t- you know, take advantage of the relationships that we have, which I think we have really good ones here um, because we've all kind of grown up in the system and we've all worked together. We all have a common goal. Uh, that's really the important part. Um, if you're not, don't have the sh- shared goal, then you're really going to be at odds. And, and frankly, that's a, a lot of the odds. We're at odds with a lot of uh, organizations, environmental organizations. We just don't agree. And we agree on the what. We don't agree on the how. Yeah. And that's that's something we've we've tried to work with them on. If not, we've got other partners out there that we're going to work. But you, you talk about elected officials. Absolutely, that's essential. Um, no matter how much you like or you may dislike your legislature, um, they – set our budgets, they pass laws, they have a responsibility for wildlife management. They are part of wildlife management. We are not an autonomous relation, uh, uh, agency with no relationship. It's, a, it's absolutely essential for us to have that trust and um, um, relationship with all of our elected officials uh, as we try to pass legislation through and last session was a pretty good one yeah and i think i think a good example of that is your license fee increase Mm -hmm. that you were able to get through last session that took a couple years yep uh the first couple times i believe it wasn't real popular didn't make it through so you had to go back continue working on it um you know ultimately those legislators can hear from constituents that you may not hear from that's right and, you know, they represent everyone in their district and your, the state as a whole. So it's I can imagine it's frustrating as you looking at it as, a, as an agency director that you have a constituency of folks who buy licenses that say we want to increase ourselves and then have to go through the effort to convince the legislature that that's a good idea. That's right. Um, and then ultimately, is that enough funding? We all agree conservation needs more funding and it should be nonpartisan but you know you were just describing the growing demands in this state Mm -hmm. and the growing issues going i I can't see it getting any cheaper and our cost of living is going up and you have to make adjustments for that too and i think it's important to uh, point out that that license fee increase was not just hunting and fishing licenses Mm -hmm. it was also all your parks and recreation fees as well so it's important to note that because they're paying increasingly paying their way as well um and so that goes to that that discussion mm-hmm. about having to balance well it, it you're right I, it, it's we did we had two two legislative sessions the first bill failed um the second bill we we regrouped it wasn't the same bill uh the first year we tried to uh run a a commission authority you know the our commission has the ability or at least at the time we thought should have the ability to raise them however they see fit based on input from the hunters and anglers. And, and I'll tell you, you you know, this, um, we have commission meetings. We are as engaged as anybody at a state agency level with our customers. Um, that, that didn't pass, um, and, uh, died in the Senate side. And then we regrouped and we went back for a much more conservative increase. It did include the state park side of annual and daily, along with about a $8 increase across the board. That went through and it was probably one of the most voted on in support bills that we saw go through the legislature last year. But it really, you know, if, if you want to put yourself in my chair, what I was seeing and hearing was the legislature one, the, one, they're looking out for what the increases are. Then the second piece of that is, well, where's the money going to go? And so we had to kind of walk, you know, that line, and we made a lot of commitments to get this thing through. Um, but you're right. They, they represent people in the district. Those are our customers as well, and we try to meet in the middle. But, you know, you got to build trust. If the legislature does not trust you or what you're going to do or what you have done, uh, it takes time to rebuild. And that was, um, people talk about two legislative sessions. That was actually a four-year effort. Because yeah. the first year, it was, oh, well, you know, here's the old agency is, okay, it's been 10 years, time for another increase. That, to me, wasn't going to fly, particularly in light of, well, what are we spending our money on now? Where Where are our customers in this? Where's the hunters and anglers in this? And we were not prepared so we had to lay groundwork for two years to get that thing at least to a bill so what you're talking about is is some 
an increase that's fair and equitable to the people of Colorado and others, and then being effective and efficient with that funding once right. it is there. And right. I think you've done a great job on that. I still think Colorado's opportunities and the cost you pay for that are high quality. Absolutely. Given what yep. you have here. I agree. Um, now, shifting gears a little bit, <clears throat> migratory pathways for big game has been a huge issue yeah. Over the past few years, and I know you've been a part of it because of your relationship with the, the Mule Deer Working Group. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us, I mean, we know that these areas up in the high country get a lot of snow. What's the importance of understanding the, the migratory pathways for big game and other wildlife, and how are you going about addressing it? Wow. Well, I, I think, to me, if you're going to talk about issues of wildlife, in particular mule deer, our ability to conserve and preserve and protect cor migration corridors is essential. It's essential. With the, the migratory from winter range to summer range and back and forth in this state, um, something as, as complex as a highway that is going in, where we're seeing thousands of animals being killed on mm -hmm. the highway, and that's not even including what the human health hazards are as well. But... And, and my goal, it starts with the science. Do we know where these corridors are? We've got a lot of collars and a lot of wildlife out there, I'll tell you. Um, but we have got to start to identify what the, where these corridors are. And not to say we're going to stop any development, but at least incorporate that in the planning process. If it is a highway or if it is an oil and gas field or if it is a, a residential development, um, it's essential in my mind, Steve, that we are identifying these, these corridors. We see wildlife coming in from Utah and Wyoming, uh, New Mexico. It's not just within our borders. And then within our borders is one of the things that we can do. Um, habitat um, uh, quality is another piece of that. And for many, you, you guys know from coming to Colorado, our winter range is probably the most developable lands that are Absolutely. out there. And you can look along I-70. Uh, that was all winter range. And it's all housing developments and ski slopes and those, you know, other types of recreation that are going on out there. So how, how do you battle that? <laughs> yeah. And, and um, uh, it's hard to walk into the Vail Valley and say you're not going to develop anymore or, or others. And so it, it's, it requires us to, one, have the science and the data, and two, it's get involved in the planning. I, I, a lot of county administrators or planning and zoning folks will sit there and tell you, go, well, geez, if I would have known, I, I, we could have done something. That's a real important point because those, that local zoning, that local yep. development um, is an absolute, uh, not just Colorado, everywhere. Yep. Um, and, and finding a resource to actually start tapping yep. into that and making them aware because I'm – I'm guessing most of it is not a sinister plot. No, <laughs> it's just it's not. misguided, you know, or, and not really knowing the science behind it. So that's that's a good good tool for you guys to be able to be working on and be able to provide out. Right. For sure. Right. Well, it's the don't know what we don't know situation, which that's right. You know, I don't know a whole lot about big time economic issues. Doesn't mean that I couldn't learn them, but that's you right. Know, you don't want to be investing your money with someone like me giving you advice. Uh, unless it isn't a hunting license in Colorado, because those are great investments. That's right. But, um, that's right. Well, but and that's a tool to the getting involved in local process. Mm -hmm. So the state agency is able to now hopefully uh, expand their information. But that's opportunities for yeah. for people who are passionate about hunting, um, for about mule deer um, chapters of Mule Deer Foundation or Elk Foundation right. or whatever. Those are places where they can really make a difference, is by understanding that and then helping and working in their local planning because. That yeah. may yeah. be one of the most important ways to, to help yeah. mule deer. Well, in, in a lot of these chapters, like you mentioned with Mule Deer Foundation and others, I mean, they are those people sometimes. They are working for counties and cities. They have day jobs, and then they do this, you know, volunteer their time and money and effort. And, you know, understanding for, for our folks, you know, who can get in and have contacts and who can get in and work with those folks and say, hey, I can I can set you up with somebody. I know the mayor or I know the county board. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It's it's taking it's advantage of those. Yeah. Yes. Of those relationships. Yeah. So uh, we, we've been talking to others and, and looking at the impact of Secretary Order 3362 facilitation of uh, and coordination with states on migratory corridors for big game 
Um, I know Colorado has submitted a uh, state action plan. Mm -hmm. It's been approved by uh, the Department of Interior. Now you're going to be looking at implementing. Explain maybe where your priorities lie in that and where you think you can go, um, at least in the near term, with the funding that's coming out through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the relationships you have with uh, both the federal agencies, but more importantly, some of the folks who implement that, whether it be a nonprofit organization or landowners or universities. So. Well, it, one, it, the, with that secretarial order came out, it, it was – you ever work for something for like 15 years and it never, yeah, yeah it, and it never produced anything. And then the secretarial order comes out and you're like, oh, thank God. We you can know, finally I, do something. We finally got acknowledgement that these are important. Um, and, and 15 years prior to that, you know, Western Governors Association yeah. took this on, mm -hmm. uh, the crucial habitats. I think that's where tool. we first met was, it was. the WGA stuff. So. I think it was, Steve. Yeah. And, and it was a way for all of us to look at, and I was in Arizona at the time, and it, to look at, one is, well, where are those areas? Mm -hmm. I mean, here, here was the worst case, right? It was, was Jody can come up to me and say, Bob, where's your most important wildlife corridors? And I'd be like, I have no idea. I might go ask some biologists out there, and he might draw a circle on a map with a crayon and go, okay, here, Jody. Well, we should be a little more sophisticated than that. But, you know, it was really is, is that secretarial order, not only for the funding that is coming, the essential funding that's coming for that, but it's an acknowledgement by the federal government that these are important. These are important, and we want to work with the states. That, to me, was you couldn't have written a better secretarial order and, and certainly emphasizing the, the, uh, the partnerships that the states and the feds have, which we talked about a little bit earlier. This is really, I hope, continues forever because, again, how important these quarters are. But it also includes science. It includes the ability to collect that data and it includes funding to get stuff done on the ground, whether that's habitat improvement or maybe it's set aside lands or working with landowners or whatever. Um, that to me, when I read that, it was just the light sh shone down and ah, the angels were singing <laughs> kind of a. So, so you can tell the skeptic, the person who looks at politics and looks at things that come out at the cabinet secretary or through these uh, executive orders and other things that say, no, this one's going to be different. This one's going to have some meaning. Mm -hmm. We are going to see changes in the way we operate to conserve these areas. And more importantly, we're going to see better coordination, collaboration between the federal agencies and the state on right. these issues. Right. And to me, that's worth its weight in gold. Um, yep. Having been there, when you talk about having worked on something for 15 mm -hmm. years, I have worked on <laughs> migratory <laughs> pathway issues yep. for 15 years. I was up in the upper green part of uh, Wyoming working on the path of the pronghorn in the red desert to hoe back and prayed that we had something like this. Yeah. And so having seen it come out last year, and I've said this on our podcast, I'm ecstatic. Now seeing it move towards being funded and being implemented. Hey, yeah. as much as a skeptic I am, I, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. And, you know, we haven't mentioned this, Bob. I know you've been a part of it through our coordination, but the Mule Deer Foundation is going to be getting a capacity grant mm -hmm. to work on these issues as we've talked. Colorado is going to be one of our priority states. So we really look forward to working with you in the state on your priorities, but, but really building this to something that is going to be, you know, that seventh generation approach that yeah, the things we right. do now are going to benefit Absolutely. For at least seven generations. So. I couldn't agree more, Steve. And, and you know, in a lot of the – when you, you we talked about a relationship with the federal, the federal agencies and the state agencies, and a lot, where a lot of that tension comes from is supremacy. Who, who's the mm -hmm. supreme out there on the land? And, we, <laughs> you know, we, we all fight. And, well, this to me acknowledges the role the states have and acknowledges through capacity grants what the non-governmental organizations have – and I'll be the first one to admit, sometimes the feds aren't the best leads. Sometimes the states aren't the best leads. And if, if we're going to allow this to longevity, right, we want this to go on forever to be something that will stand the test of time. Well, it's not just saying one's in charge. We need a community here that is in charge. And, and that secretarial order, I think, acknowledges that across the table is we're here to help. We're going to rely on the states. 
who are going to work with partners who are going to tell us what their priorities are and we're not going to second guess them. And so the onus is put on us. And to me, that, that's what separates this from anything I've seen in my career, that uh, that approach, I think, is what's going to create the longevity. If the skeptics would just, hey, you, you, you make hay when the sun is shining, and it is shining right now. Let's not second guess. So we're running a little short on time here, Bob, but what's your number one priority in the state for corridors, for, big, for, for mule deer corridors? Um, well, I, right now we've got efforts going on about highways. Um, we have, oh, oh, you're talking about location. Yeah. Ah, the but white. Tell the folks of Colorado where they're going to see this effort play out. Well, the Bears Ears and the White River landscape in northern Colorado. That's not the Bears Ears in Utah that comes. No. So <laughs> Different <Nope>. bear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we identified that area as well. The second is down in the San Juans. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, if you're going to come up with two, it was really hard. But we wanted to make sure that we captured those as well. So you should be seeing some efforts going on down there through the Secretary Order, coupled with our work with the Mule Deer Foundation and Parks and Wildlife. We're going to be working around the state. Here are those habitat projects? Are they conservation easements? Are they? They're habitat. They're projects. habitat projects. Yep. So it's going to be going in and making sure that the habitat stays functional in these important areas. Exactly. Nice. Exactly. And for those of you who don't, uh, aren't biologists out there, habitat function is really what leads us to our populations. Mm -hmm. Good, healthy Absolutely. populations need functional habitat. That means you need the right places Fawning in the right conditions winter. at the right time yep. of year. So, yeah. Yep. Um, so one other thing that we haven't talked about yet because it's a big issue here in the state of, uh, of Colorado is chronic wasting disease. Um, I know you guys made some adjustments in your zones this year as well, and um, it's a concern. Tell us what's going on, and yeah. do you have any – you probably don't have any data yet from this hunting season, but um, – No, but, but, not yeah. yet. Well, yeah, we've – well, you know, we've been in, in chronic wasting disease for t over 20 years. It's it's pretty much found here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first cases was here. And in Colorado, way before I'd come on board, it decided we're going to invest in research. We're going to be one of the agencies that, uh, well, we're, we're saddled with it. Uh, how are we going to learn from it? And so with a lot of research that's been going on, uh, testing, um, state of the state of the science that's been going on, as you know, this is rolling out West into Canada, mm. um, that we in the commission decided that we need a chronic wasting disease plan. And so we've been un embarking on that for just under the last part of this year to talk about what is it we're going to do. And so I think before you get into anything real prescriptive is, is, is to kind of acknowledge and set the tone. One, we are not going to get rid of chronic wasting disease. It is here. It is here forever. Two is, well, what is the level that we want to manage at? Uh, if, you, if you exclude zero, well, anything between one and 100% is really where we are focusing mm -hmm. on. And then the third part is we are not going to do the scorched earth policy that we know chronic wasting disease can get hot, red hot, and like in a heat map, it can be really hot in a very small area. Well, then why are we talking about game management unit or data analysis unit wide that we need to be local and we need to implement actions that are local um, to minimize what the prevalence rates are going to be? And then you roll that across the state, it's different everywhere. But mm -hmm. the bottom line is, unless we have heads to test and then have the data, we aren't going to be doing anything. One positive chronic wasting disease deer it, in an area does not constitute action. We need to have data that is informing that and it is going to be informed and developed with our hunters, our local landowners and others. And so they're gonna be part of the decision-making process. And what this plan does is say, Here's a kind of our threshold, about 5% prevalence. We're going to start doing things that could be more testing. That could be, uh, you know, we may remove a few deer out of the population and get those numbers. Um, with them, as many deer that are harvested in the state annually, we can get the numbers. And so we want to be sure. So anyway, 
with all of that, that plan rolling out, uh, we're, we went out, we had a working group put together, uh, biologists of, of conservation organizations and, and guides and outfitters. And so we think we've come up with a plan that, geez, not everybody's going to agree with. Um, but I, I want this to be as well, this is how we're going to make decisions in the future. So that was almost as, as important about that plan as actually what the plan says. Wow. And keeping people engaged, because you guys know, if, yep. if we leave the hunting public behind on this... Oh, you'll hear about it. Oh, <laughs> well, the you two, will. Which is understandable. I mean, The we two have, things sure. I see are the biggest issues with CWD from a hunter's perspective is, one, the density issue. Yep. You're probably going to have to manage for lower deer and lower mature bucks yep. to get you below a, a prevalence rate that you're happy with. And B, the transportation issue of taking yes. infected or potentially infected meat home from an area that has a quarantine on it. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks are used to taking their deer home whole. And now they're going to be told they have to bone it out, take the skull mm -hmm. plate, treat the skull plate. You know, on someone that's come here or is on a weekend hunt, that might be tough to do. Yes. And I've said on, on previous episodes, I hope that doesn't lead to more carcass dumping. You know, yeah. when yeah. folks get home Waste. or sneaking areas out, you know, I've said all along that if you look at the highways from where chronic wasting disease is spread, it probably is some correlation to the travel corridors that cars run on because people are taking it home. They're, they're, they're taking, they're yeah. dumping a carcass or they're taking their bones out to the wildlands to, to dispose of them. And, you know, they don't know the animals infected. So it ends up. You know, infecting new areas. I know in the county I live in, we're in the hot spot in Montana. Mm -hmm. Right. We have to take it to our landfill, which is 60 miles away. And, you know, a lot of folks, I mean, it was just learning last week on how to make bone broth out of the femurs from animals. And now do I want to do that now that I mm -hmm. live in, you know, and so it's going to change some traditions, some culture and behaviors. And we know change is hard. And it's gonna, we're gonna resist, and we're gonna not like it. We're gonna be looking for someone to blame. So hopefully we don't. What you said is about putting a plan out there more on how we're gonna react in the future is probably as important because yeah. they know what you're gonna do as an agency, and it's not gonna be that surprise. So you know, kudos right. to you guys doing that, and you know, hopefully we'll get live deer tests. You know, yes, <laughs> that, that'd be nice. Uh, approved that, that we can get out there and start figuring out it is without having to wait on heads. So. Yeah. And I know they're yeah. working on that. So, well, and you're right. And the other part of this is, you know, you have states like Colorado and Wyoming who've, who've been dealing with chronic wasting disease. But then you look across the country and there are some that are not positive uh, or aren't confirmed positive yet and then are just coming online. Us as states are really. Uh, all over the board in the map with yeah. what can you import um, and can you, uh, you know, we had calls uh, from from another state that said, hey, can you let all the, the, the non-resident hunters who come to Colorado, let them know that they can't bring their animal back. And it was, <laughs> and it was. A they want you to be the bad guy yeah. for their right. import laws. Well, so. it, it said, well, one, why did you make that decision? And so there's, there's the knee jerk reacts uh, overreactions. And, and so we, what we've been trying to do, like when states have come on board at Texas is an example with all of their, uh, captive, uh, transports of cervids around that our folks went down there. Cause when they hit positive a couple of years ago, they wanted to know, what do we do? What, what do we know about this disease? But what's interesting too, I know you guys are following this is Congress is picking up on chronic wasting disease and what, effort can the federal government provide either through APHIS, you know, veterinary services and those that really have, if you want to talk about live animal testing, yeah. I think they're the ones that are really going to develop it. Mm. Well, and, and, you know, from an average Joe standpoint is you, you prohibit me from doing things, but you have deer walking across state lines yeah. and you have import of possibly contaminated products through commercial sales or, yeah. you know, transfer. And so it really, we don't want to blame one individual or one entity and, and you know we got to own this mm -hmm. we have to own this before we don't own this because when we don't own it you're going to have other folks making a decision about things that we should be making decision of as wildlife professionals and 
primarily the state agencies with the authority over wildlife. Yep. Whether it comes to hunting or not, you know, we don't want to see wasted deer out there. With all the urban deer you have in Colorado, I imagine that's a public relation nightmare waiting to happen. Yeah, so. absolutely. So, yeah, it's stay tuned. And, it, you know, and I think the, the biggest um, uh, recognition that we had to get over was we will not eradicate CWD. Yep. It's and and it's we not are going away. it's not and we're learning new things. Those prions, you know, they're like any any. I'm going to my microbiology major before I got smart and went to wallet. But I mean, <laughs> it's just like anything. It wants to survive. Right. If a virus or bacteria or whatever, they can survive and they're going to move on. How do we how do we stay ahead of that? How do we just not rest and and put all of our eggs in one basket? And and I think for Colorado's sake. As long as I'm here, I think it's having the research and, and staying on the cutting edge, leading, bleeding edge of, of what that science is saying, working with other states and other experts, implementing actions on the ground, measuring them, and then readjusting if we need to. Yep. So I think that's the key. Well, I think you're taking a great approach to it, Bob. Um, looks like we're out of time here. You've given us, uh, you know, considerable Very amount generous, of your busy yes. time um we want to thank you thank you for everything you do for wildlife thank you for what you do in colorado taking a leadership role and all the things you do thank you for everything you're doing for mule deer and we look forward to working with you in the state of colorado uh to make and to maintain colorado as a destination spot for mule deer viewing for mule deer hunting and for conservation in general and so um Happy hunting this weekend. Yeah. Thank you. We hope that Much you success. fill that freezer. And uh, well, My daughter's got her elk tag coming this weekend, too. So we're hoping. Good. Yeah, well, let me know. <laughs> I hope you guys, you're successful, too. But uh, it was a real pleasure talking to you guys. Thanks for your All time. Right. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Belinda. And I'm Jody Stemler. We're talking from Denver. And thank you very much for listening to Talking Mule Deer. Thanks for Talking Mule Deer with Steve Belinda and Jody Stemler. The Mule Deer Foundation is the only conservation group in North America dedicated to restoring, improving, and protecting mule deer and black-tailed deer and their habitat. MDF is a strong voice for hunters in access, wildlife management, and conservation policy issues. To find out more, visit www.muledeer.org and stay tuned for the next episode of Talkin' Mule Deer.